very much for that kind of introduction. This is going to be the, almost the other reflection on Dan's presentation, because I'm going to uh, approach it from a clinical point of view, both looking at clinical trials and also just a wee bit of clinical efficacy. So these are my declarations of interest. We were asked to leave up our declarations of interest so you could all read it. Now, I haven't gone mad. You know, Astra aren't paying me lots of money, and if you can really think it through, you'll see there's a theme to the way I've done my declarations, okay? There's no prize for getting, getting what it is, but okay. So before I go on to some of the trial evidence, I'm going to tease you because I'm aware of the fact I'm speaking in England. In Scotland, we have the sign guidelines. Sign guidelines were updated two years ago to take account of the cardiovascular outcome trials that were accruing, because NICE refused to do that. So NICE still haven't made any real comments on the cardiovascular outcome trials. They are now in the process of revising guidelines with a prospect of 2021. So unfortunately, NICE is an embarrassment to the whole world, and it's really the only major guideline that hasn't updated. Now, from the sign guideline, I'm showing you here just comparisons of two drugs, because I'm aware that we're really focusing on, today, GL pulmonary receptor agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors. So these are what sign summarizes. And actually, yep, sorry, this, this is not the SGLT, this is the DPP4. Um, oral for the DPP4 injectable, currently for GLP1. Sign positions DPP4 second line versus third line for GLPs. Efficacy now... That's one of the things that Dan didn't mention, of course, is that these are not particularly potent drugs, the DPP4 inhibitors, whereas the GLP1 receptor agonists clearly are. And similarly, SGLT2 inhibitors sit somewhere in the middle. So while we're using these drugs and we're aware of the extended cardiovascular benefits of GLPs and SGLT2s, with regard to efficacy, by far the most efficacious are the GLP1 receptor agonists. And I'll show you some comparisons now head to head with SGLTs towards the end. No cardiac benefits, as Dan illustrated, for DPP4s. Yes, for GLPs, but not for all of them. Uh, hyperglycemia risk for both is low. Weight neutral for the DPP4 inhibitors. Weight loss, and again, in clinical practice, that's a reason to go ahead in this direction and in the direction of SGLT2 inhibitors. Many of our patients have been trying for a very long time to lose weight, so why would we give them a drug that's weight neutral? Easy to take, yep, slightly more complex GLPs and SGLT2s, a longer conversation with the patient, and of course for this one just now, a bit of education on how to give an injection. So the reason we have the cardiovascular outcome trial data, remember, goes back to the Rosie Glitterson controversy. That changed the way phase three development of new drugs was done. It changed it in two ways. Number one, it meant that in the development program, when we're looking just at efficacy, we used patients who were much more representative of the broad population of people with diabetes, not just fit and healthy people with type 2 diabetes, but older patients, patients who have existing renal problems, patients who have existing cardiovascular outcomes. And during the phase three efficacy studies, any cardiac outcome is blindly adjudicated. So during that part, you accrue safety data, and then secondly, in the focus of today, you also have dedicated cardiovascular outcome trials. And it's the results of these trials, I think, are transforming the management of type 2 diabetes and potentially other diseases as well. Now this, we see lots and lots of this kind of uh, graph showing the outcome trials. I'm going to first of all look at DPP4 inhibitors, just very, very briefly. I draw your attention to the fact that we're now finished. That's it for DPP4 cardiovascular outcome trials. We're unlikely to get any more data. There was one other trial that sat in there, the Omari Glipton cardiovascular outcome trial. Omari Glipton was a one weekly, been developed by MSD, but they decided for business reasons not to continue it, so the CVOT was abandoned. And it has been launched in Japan, but clearly they won't get safety data, so it won't be launched in Europe or in the US. So we have the results of the CVOTs. There are five outcome, five outcome trials with four drugs. Again, we won't ever have a trial with Vildegliptin. Vildegliptin had a license in Europe, but not in America, when these new regulations came out. The reason it didn't get it in America was to do with skin side effects, some uncertainty about immunological effects. 
So because they already had the license in Europe, commercial decision again is taken not to do a very expensive outcome trial. Instead, they did the verify trial. <coughs> you may wonder why they bothered at all doing the verify trial, but there we go. So <coughs> these are the outcome trials. These are the MACE results. In all of them, they're MACE neutral. And as Dan has said, depends if your glass is half full or half empty. Surely shows MACE safety. But there are, in the SAXA trial, an increase in hospitalization for heart failure, which was blindly adjudicated, and the definition of the heart failure was the same as used in heart failure outcome trials. So this is a real thing. It's not just ankle edema. And in the Allegriptin trial with examine, in a subgroup, there was also an increase in hospitalization for heart failure. <coughs> now, if I was to use a DPP-4 inhibitor in the future clinically, and when use of them is much less than before, I would avoid these completely. So I don't think all five are the same, because for the other three, or the other two rather, there is no hint of any heart failure harm. So in clinical practice, if you're going to use a DP4 inhibitor, and of course there are much better alternatives, um, then I would avoid uh, saxagliptin and allagliptin. Final nail in the coffin of DPP4 inhibitors is very minimal renal effects, slight reductions in albuminuria, but pretty minimal and not conclusive. So the DPP4 inhibitors, which harness the incretin effect and have effects on GLP-1, cardiovascular have been disappointing. If we now look at the GLP-1 receptor agonists, now this is a very rapidly moving area of research, just as the research in SGLT2 inhibitors is. We now have seven outcome trials. What we don't have is twice daily exanatide because, again, twice daily exanatide received a license before these new regulations come in. So we've got the Elixir trial, which was completely negative, neutral, probably because it's just such a low potency drug and it doesn't last 24 hours. The first one that demonstrated benefits was the LEADER trial with daily loraglutide. We then have SUSTAIN6 with weekly subcutaneous smaglutide, XL with weekly exanatide. Harmony outcomes with albiglutide, which of course is no longer again available for business reasons, but the study was completed. Then Rewind and Pioneer. And I'm just going to look at the bottom two just in slightly more detail, just as exemplars. So first we'll look at Rewind, and then secondly Pioneer 6 with the oral semaglutide. So Rewind was a large cardiovascular outcome trial it did extend the information we had from previous one because the majority of subjects in this trial did not have established atherosclerotic disease. There were people who were recruited because of high cardiovascular risk. And we see there's a highly significant reduction in MACE. MACE being the composite of major adverse cardiovascular events, cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, and non-fatal stroke. If we look at cardiovascular death, it's reduced, but not significantly. If we look at non-fatal myocardial infarction, slight reduction potentially, but not significantly. But in this trial, the benefit particularly is around non-fatal stroke. And that seems to be a theme that's emerging, and I'll come back to that just in a couple of minutes. Now, these large trials collect systematically lots of data. So in a back-to-back -back publication, there was publication of renal data, We see a reduction in a renal comps outcome, but it's particularly driven by new, new macroalbuminuria. So much more potent effect, much more clear effect than was seen with the DPP4 inhibitors <coughs> when they were looking at proteinuria. The hint of a reduction in EGFR, but it does not reach statistical significance. And then just a further, public, f further uh, graph from the paper, this is placebo group in in the blue versus gelaglutide group. Again, suggestion of a difference, but this difference does not reach statistical significance. Whereas for albuminuria, again, it's highly significant. So the pattern here is particularly protein, whereas if you think about the SGLT2 inhibitors and data we're going to hear much more later on today, there the effect particularly is on EGFR. So if there is an effect on EGFR, it's not clearly been shown just now. 
The Pioneer 6 was a slightly different trial. Instead of being a very large trial, it was a smaller trial, and it was done to get the safety to be able to enable it to get a license. And of course, oral semaglutide on the basis of this, plus other data, has a license in America um, and is currently being looked at in Europe. So the important thing here is the primary composite outcome, again, MACE, major adverse cardiovascular events, um, shows non-inferiority fine. There is, a, if you look at it, potentially a numerical reduction, but the number of events is extremely small, 61 versus 76, and this does not reach statistical significance. So then you've got the whole point, if you don't reach superiority there, then you can't do further analysis, but there does seem to be some effects from cardiovascular death. So it's heading in the right direction. For this one, really no clear effect on stroke. The cardiovascular death was numerically reduced, and depending on whether you believe you can do statistics on this or not, um, potentially was reduced. Now, with having so many outcome trials, we now see almost a war of meta-analysis. So I've been focusing on really the trials that we've had in the last six months. In the last six months, I've been um, able to identify three meta-analyses, although there may be more. Um, the first one I thought I'd just mention was the one that looked at strokes, because I'm aware that Derek has a particular interest in this area. So this was from the middle of the year, and it looked in more detail at the stroke outcomes from the trials, trying to tease out is there particular types of strokes that might be reduced uh, with GLP-1 receptor agonists. The biggest one was the one that was published just recently in Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology, and it includes colleagues and, of mine from Glasgow. And the advantage of this meta-analysis was as well as having access to the previous trials, they had access to the heart failure data from the obligatory trial. Because John McMurray was one of the principal investigators. And at this point in time, the albiglutide heart failure data had not been published. And then most recently, although received then and accepted then, actually is only just coming out in diabetes obesity metabolism, is what I would suggest is perhaps a predatory meta-analysis, if there is such a thing. Because what this has done is just added the Pioneer 6 data. So it really is, I think, a cheeky meta-analysis. It's not original, and of course its findings are very similar. But I've used its table. So for MACE, we see a reduction in MACE, and it's in this one, it's trying to divide it up whether you've got prior mace or not. It identifies elixir as an outlier. Cardiovascular mortality here, highly significantly reduced. Non-fatal MI doesn't reach significance. Non-fatal stroke, however, is highly significantly reduced. And then here, in this meta-analysis, as in the previous one, <coughs> included the heart failure data from albiglutide, that there is a reduction in heart failure hospitalization. Now, why that might that be? Well, if you think there's a reduction in myocardial infarction, it's hypothesized that by reducing myocardial infarction, you might have a late reduction in hospitalization for heart failure. Now, there may be other explanations, but clearly the pattern we're seeing here is very different from the SGLT2 inhibitors. We have an early and clear separation. So it's a different mechanism if there is a hospitalization for heart failure reduction. So that's the outcome trials. I thought... I'd also look at the efficacy trials, because there's been, again, two published in the last few months. The first comparison of an SGLT2 versus GLP was a duration 8 trial. And then in the last few months, we've had sustain 8 with subcutaneous semaglutide versus full-dose canagliflozin, and Pioneer 2 with the oral semaglutide versus empagliflozin. In sustain 8, semaglutide was superior and canagliflozin with regard to HbA1c and also with regards to weight. So again, emphasizing the GLP-1 receptor agonists, and particularly semaglutide, seem to be the most potent of the drugs with regards to HbA1c and also with regards to weight. The Pioneer 2 trial also showed more potency with regard to HbA1c, but no difference with regards to weight. And again, in clinical practice, if the patient particularly is wanting to lose weight, that can direct us to what therapy we choose. What about future prospects? Well, we know there's going to be further subgroup analysis. These trials cost an enormous amount of money to run. 
the, the sponsors and the clinical investigators are very keen to get more data. The stroke data from Rewind was presented at the ESD meeting by Herzl Gerstein, and at that time he said they were playing a paper, so that's no secret. Um, I'm sure there will be further uh, publications from several of the trials that we've mentioned today. There will be more completed and published trials, and I'll show you that just in a single slide. And no doubt after each trial comes out, there'll be another meta-analysis, possibly from the people in Italy who seem to specialize in it. So these are the ongoing trials, the important ones I've been able to identify. If peglinotide is a once weekly, currently in development by Sanofi, the cardiovascular outcome trial is called Amplitude O, it's fully recruited and ongoing, so it's active but not recruiting. And if you look at clinicaltrials.gov, it's estimated completion in 2021. There is some clinical data with this drug, looking at it being used perhaps every two weeks or even every month. But to date, the phase three development program has been looking at it weekly, and the cardiovascular outcome trial is the weekly formulation. Now, the type of patient that's recruited seems very similar to the other trials. So it doesn't extend the kind of patient base, um, but it will give us information about another molecule. And then for semaglutide, it's extremely busy. So for semaglutide subcutaneously, there's a cardiovascular outcome trial in overweight and obesity. Very large trial to see if there might be cardiac benefit in that group of people, as, as sustained six showed in people with, with type 2 diabetes. 2023, the result. Having done the Pioneer trial and shown some benefits but not reaching statistical significance, there's then an enormous cardiovascular outcome trial with the oral semaglutide called SOL, an outcome about a year later. And then there are two outcome trials that are looking at other aspects. So one is a renal outcome trial with semaglutide to see if there's any renal benefit. And I have heard, but I couldn't find any <coughs> information about it, that there might be a similar dual aglutide renal outcomes trial. So this is in people with diabetes, CKD and or proteinuria, and looking at a composite renal outcome. And then because in the SUSTAIN-6 trial there was an increase in retinopathy, there's also the FOCUS trial, which is a retinal safety trial in diabetes. So each year, we're going to get more data and potentially more meta-analysis. Three take-home messages. I started with the DPV4 inhibitors. They were MACE neutral. Some seem to increase heart failure, pretty minor effects in the kidneys. The GLP1 receptor agonists clearly reduce MACE. The emerging theme that it particularly seems to be strokes. And therefore, whatever the benefit might be, and Dan very elegantly talked about the different mechanisms of the benefit, it seems to be strokes that benefit more than cardiac disease. Later effects in hospitalization for heart failure and significant effects on reducing albuminuria. And then finally, there are several ongoing trials with both the subcutaneous and oral formulations of semaglutide. Thank you for your attention.